So uh, thank you all for coming um, to our talk, which we hope really is more of a conversation. Um, I'm Lisa Kessler. Hopefully most of you have seen the show already or you'll come over afterwards. Um, I do want to thank, though, uh, Howard and Renee for putting this all together, the show and the talk. All your support through this whole process, which has been a long time in the making. Um, so I want to introduce, just tell you a little bit about why I have my two side gals here. <laughs> Uh, and who they are and what we have to do with each other. And then just give you a little introduction to the talk and of the conversation. So, um, so Kathy is someone who I met in 2002 outside of the Cathedral of the Holy Cross, which is down the street, actually with John and Lucia, who were there as well. Um, probably in the early months of when the first revelations of, about the crimes in the Catholic Church were revealed in the Boston Globe. And it was a pretty intense time. And it, it, I can't tell you when I exactly met Kathy because the whole nature of my work and of documentary work is to just keep showing up. And so I was there over a long period of time. And eventually, we got to know each other. and form a kind of uh, connection. Mm -hmm. And eventually, um, you know, by 2003, I really felt that my still photographs weren't telling the whole story and absolutely weren't conveying the complexity of the survivors who I had met. And so Kathy was one of three survivors who agreed to work with me, having long conversations that I recorded and that became the um, audio part of um, Heart in the Womb. Um, Kathy also was involved with um, a lot of, or I should say is involved with a lot of very collaborative, uh, cooperative uh, projects with other survivors of clergy abuse, starting way back with something called the Call to Reform, which, well, you can talk about it, uh, a Truth and Reconciliation Committee, um, in an organization, well, SNAP, the Survivors Network of Those Abused by Priests, and um, uh, STOP, Speak Truth to Power. Um, and I'll let you tell more about yourself when, yeah. when it's your turn. Uh, okay. <laughs> I have a lot more to say. <laughs> Billy and I met um, when I, I saw her photographs, probably on a blog somewhere, and I immediately recognized um, that they were also photographs that had aspects of the Catholic Church as a subject, but that they weren't about religion per se. That they were definitely, aside from being beautiful, they were getting at other things than religion or institutions. I didn't know exactly what, but I just sent her an email and said, hey, you know, there's a little connection here between our bodies of work. I'm looking to amplify mine. Would you be willing to talk to me? And and now, two and a half, three years later, here we are. Um, um, Billy and I have written a proposal together to show our work together. I should tell you that her work is um, <laughs> the work that brought us together is uh, published in this book called Reconciliation, and it's a 10-year uh, study that she made of Catholic confessionals. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful book, and it's a beautiful body of work where she's taking a large format camera and looking at the photographs, looking at the, the spaces very slowly and carefully. And so it's kind of the reflective, she can talk more, she'll talk more about it, but um, and so we've written a proposal together. We're hoping to put our show on the road, which maybe Kathy will be part of. We're hoping to find an institution, <laughs> museum, larger institution, who would understand what we're trying to do with our work together. So that's my very brief introductions of these two wonderful <laughs> um, friends um, who are connected by our work. And I just, 
we came up with three ideas that we want to talk about. Um, and the first one is that our work, all of us, you know, you know, Kathy's, well, I'm not going to put a label on you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but all of our work ha is about much more than the church. Um, and so, you know, we'll each talk about that a little bit, maybe, of what our work, whether it's art or activism or combination, um, you know, where do we see that connecting to other parts of society? The second idea is that art is a different language. There's a lot of artists here today, I can see, so a lot of you are familiar with maybe some of the ideas that we'll talk about. But just see the idea that um, art uses a different language to address whatever the subject is, whatever the topic is, uh, very different from words. And so often um, some of us might stumble with the words and hope the pictures <laughs> tell the story. But, uh, and the third idea is just very simply that we all work from a perspective of, um, of openness. Um, of trying to stay open to whatever is in front of us. I mean, me personally, when I'm out photographing something, I, I really try not to have, I don't have an idea what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a preconceived idea of what I'm trying to say with the photographs. And um, so we'd like to like, carry that sense of openness into this conversation here. Um, and so if anyone has, what we're going to do is we'll have a little conversation amongst ourselves. And if during that time, anyone has questions, you feel free to jump in and, you know, ask it with fine with interruptions. And then we will leave time, we'll leave a chunk of time for people to ask direct questions. Mm -hmm. So, um, where should we start? Um, one thing we didn't figure out. <laughs> you want to go? Yeah. You want to go, Billy? Or... No. You want me to get sandwiched between the two of them and have that hammered just? Why don't you start? Just because yeah. you yeah. started a little further yeah. back in yeah. history. Yeah. Back. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Hi. Um, as, again, my name's Kathy, and um, sometimes words are difficult. Images are much more easier to convey to an audience. Um, even poetry. Even though those are words, when you do do poetry, sometimes you can sort of convey it in a, in a more prepared way than the spontaneous um, words. That actually is a picture of me, and it's an image that all of us survivors used back in 2002. We brought pictures. It was a way to get people who were going into the church and people in general who were reading about this and were having the most hardest time not, not just accepting what had been revealed, but understanding uh, the dynamic, because there was a bunch of adults talking about what happened to them as kids. And I think this is really a good example of how images is a different language. Mm -hmm. You can do, it, it's, it, I think of it in American Sign Language as a different language, and also using images. And so when they would see all these pictures of, of little kids, young kids, this was me when I was making my first communion, it would sort of help orient them to, time, to the time we're talking about. Um, and there, that while we were there protesting and doing what we were doing, and, um, people were coming and trying to understand. Um, I met this woman with a camera. <laughs> and um, I, I just, I just, felt very, very um, good about Lisa. She was held in a great suspicion, though, because she worked for the Archdiocese of Boston, and not too many people trusted her at all. They thought her work was for the, for the church. Mm -hmm. And I put church in quotes, mm -hmm. because it's like in this state, we don't even have to say Catholic church. <laughs> you know, all we have to do is say church, and everybody knows what we're talking about, which, again, is like language, language is is so limited in what it can convey, convey to people. It can exclude people all the time, language, or it can include people. It, it really depends on the consciousness of the person who's using the language, mm -hmm. you know. 
So um, anyhow, I didn't, I didn't sense, I, I sense your energy, which is so uh, probably as a survivor, something I learned to do, you know, who has good energy, who has, who, who I, you know, my God, I've been in therapy like for years, you know, so I, I've done a lot of work um, on myself and, and on healing. And so, and we just gradually got friendlier and friendlier and, and, and it really didn't, I understood what she was saying. She had no um, goal. She didn't have the outcome in mind. Um, but I, she did share later that, that she did think the church was going to make it all better in, 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 uh, in the beginning, um, which I think most people did think that, like, to hear what had happened. The other thing that, that really, um, for me, was because I'm also a survivor of incest, um, this was so much more to me, um, the protest, and it wasn't just about the church. How, you know, to be heard, believed, and accepted is what people who have been sexually abused need to have. And, and it, what, even today, is still so hard to find. I mean, there was an article in about this, and, and uh, somebody wrote a comment, and, the, and, the, and, and she said, and Kathy Dwyer claims to be oh, yeah. a, a survivor. Um, and so it was, in the it, yeah, in the globe article, so, something to that effect. So there's always that, oh, they're out there for the money, they're out there, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't know too many people who made it up. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not something you want to make up, number one. Um, number two, um, well, just stay with number one. Uh, but anyhow, so. Yeah, that was going to be my question for you was like, the things that you were doing, you were different than a lot of the other survivors who were out there who were kind of just coming to grips with it and different from some of the activists, the protesters who were shocked that this had happened. Mm -hmm. And because of your previous experience with these, some of these issues. Yeah, I had started my healing journey um, from my childhood trauma in the um, early 80s. I had been in protests about sexual abuse. I remember one protest we walked through Chinatown, and the cops came, and we ran and scattered. And I remember I was with a, um, I was dating at the time uh, a professor, and she was a professor of, at Harvard Divinity School, and she sure didn't want to get caught. <laughs> and so we just like scattered everywhere. Um, so we went, you know, everything that was done at the church it was on the shoulders of those who came before. The difference, but I think that's true for everything. You know, we're all we're all just moving forward on those who went went before us, and hopefully we're going to be a little bit further on and leave the place so that the people who stand on our shoulders are a little bit further along than we are. Um, but so to me, it was just just about so much more, and it wasn't just about church; it was about institutions. But the fact, I think it was Judy Herman that said. The least safest place for a child to grow up is in their own home. And people can't take that in at all. You know, that is so difficult for people to hear. But statistically, that's true. Um, so, um, and I can, you know, get to the details of the statistics. So I, I don't have them right here in my brain, but I do have them written down somewhere where, where that quote's from. Um, so it was like, how do we get this movement to really bring everybody in to it and start? challenging the institutions, the abuses of power. And then it goes into abuse of power, because that's actually what sexual abuse is. So, any, yeah. any I think that's enough for right now, my introduction, anybody? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and then, um, I don't know if you want to just jump in, or you want me to throw you a question? Sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so, um, so, when I first saw your photographs, I just thought this is someone who is, understands the church in an intimate kind of way, mm -hmm. yet uh, there's a little bit of distance from it. And do you want to talk about that yeah. at all? And just sure. like how you approach this whole project? Yeah, so I guess uh, I began this project about a little over 10 years ago. Um, I was raised Catholic. I grew up teaching catechism and things like that. Um, shortly after, um, so this is a little bit my, my personal background. So shortly after I, I came out to my parents, they stopped talking to me. And so there was this large this rift in my family. And I would say a lot of the, um, the anger that I felt towards uh, my parents, I also felt towards the church. 
And I began this project for many reasons, um, but one of them was, um, I guess, a, a way to sort of think about, um, is to sort of grapple with what had happened to my family and what Catholicism um, meant towards my coming out and the sort of rift that had occurred with my parents. And um, I began photographing the confessionals in part because I thought they were an interesting sort of conceptual link in the church. Um, I've been thinking about, um, well, so that, hold on, so the, going back to the background with Catholicism, so that was actually, that's how I got access to a lot of churches, just because that's an interesting, interesting tidbit that um, I was able to sort of speak the language of, um, of, of confession. I could talk about the sacrament of reconciliation when I met with priests and, and so forth. Um, but um, I think so much of my project is about reckoning or grappling, which is why I think it's such an interesting um, word to have started off with. And as I've been preparing to come here, I've been thinking about how these, those three words that you threw out for us, Lisa, the idea of reckoning, um, art, and um, openness are so interconnected. Um, um, I think one of the things that drew me to the confessionals is that they are, in some ways, I think of them as almost like the humblest part of the church, right? They're, they're not the part of the church that is forward-facing at all. You can, the church itself can be grand and beautiful and elegant, and the landscaping can be perfect. Nobody sees the confessional. Um, and that's new, and it's an interesting metaphor for the lack of reckoning within the institution and the sort of necessary reckoning that needs to happen at an individual level, that one reckons with things by looking at these like small spaces inside oneself. I'm interested in this idea of the interior, of looking inside as a way to, um, as a way to move forward, as a way of grappling, um, as a way of um, being able to hold complexity and paradox. I think you can't have complexity if you aren't able to see those like small, dirty spaces that are hidden away. Um, and one of the things I like about photography um, is that it allows you to see um, multiple things at one time, that you sort of see what's there, but then you also see the layers that are behind the existence of the subject there. Um, and so I think that goes back to the idea of um, reckoning, and then I keep thinking that openness isn't really possible if you don't, uh, or rec openness is the necessity of what comes after reckoning. So sort of if you are able to do the work of reckoning, then that allows for a kind of openness. And I would say that in the process of working on these pictures, I became less angry at the church and more open in a way. And this isn't like, I'm not doing this as like an apology for the church or anything like that. But simply that making angry pictures didn't work. Like I couldn't, I began making these like very kind of angry, aggressive pictures, very German <laughs> pictures. And they, and they just were very bad and they weren't interesting. And I realized that if I was able to make pictures that sort of took into account the individual experiences of people that I know who went to church or I would meet people when I was at the, um, the churches who had these very personal experiences, that the images took on a lot more, um, a lot more depth and complexity, and that, that was a lot more. Um, th that was what I wanted to communicate, rather than the sort of singular, singular kind of anger. Wow. Oh. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Change things for me when um, Renee and Howard and I were doing the installation and the layout, and you know, it was actually quite fast. You know, very skilled. They know the space. They do the work. And then I remember how it turned to me and said, "What do you think? How do you like it?" And I just said, "I don't know. I can't see it. Like I can't absorb it." But over the course of these six weeks of the show being up. Um, I, it's really changed things in me. You know, it's, it's made everything very public and it's given me the opportunity to have a lot of conversations, both in the media and with friends and colleagues. And I really feel like, how do I say it? Um, the work has stood the test of time and the, the instincts that I had at the time that this was about something much bigger than the church and you know my own idea was that was the connection between the clergy abuse and sexual abuse that goes on all day long in homes and all kinds of places 
Um, and it, it's, I've been able to get to where I really understand that what the survivors did by coming forward and speaking up about the most blasphemous thing, you know, that a, a priest um, could harm a child, could rape a child, could assault a child, molest a child, that um, that people now can talk about the bigger ideas of how it's connected to um, other forms of abuse in society, and that. The Me Too movement, which was not anywhere on the radar. I mean, back in 2002, we were still kind of clinging to the work of the women's movement to address sexual assault. Um, and now, the other day in a class, I asked students, it wasn't they weren't my students, I asked them how many of them felt that if they spoke up today, if someone was hurting them and they spoke up, do they think they would believe? Be believed, and every single one of them raised their hand. And I just thought it's really encouraging because it was not true for any one of our generations. And um, you know, even that story that came out the other day related to um, Katanji Brown Jackson's mm -hmm. hearing, and that the, uh, you know they were trying to harass her and talk about you know that her decision was supporting pornography and that this young man who she gave too lenient a sentence to, and he was interviewed in the Washington Post and he said, um, I, couldn't, I couldn't talk about this and so I looked at some pictures and um, she understood that there was, like, you know, he needed, a, he needed a chance there. Anyway, um, I don't know if that answered the question yeah. at all. Yeah. 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 What do you think? <laughs> wow. Bring it to us. Yeah. Yeah, jump in. Uh, I have a question. Was it, you were when you started this? You were she. The, the, or sorry, so, so I spent the '90s um, as a freelance photographer for the pilot for the Archdiocesan newspaper. Right, and, and as it became more, you know, as the story started to come out. By the time the story came out, I wasn't working for the okay. Archdiocese anymore. I'd moved on. But um, as is my habit, I didn't burn any bridges. <laughs> and so I was able to go to um, the Archdiocese and request permission to have access to, do, uh, to document what was happening um, on my own, not as a, not as a job. Um, and I was granted the permission with the one caveat that I not release the pictures into the news cycle, mm -hmm. which I had absolutely no interest in the news cycle because the news cycle was this steamroller, and I'm, you know, yeah. in, in some ways, slow. <laughs> you know, I had no interest in that. I was, still, I wanted to understand what was happening, and I knew it would take time. It's taken me a long time, and I feel like the culture is kind of caught up. So, so you didn't feel like you were censored in any way that you could mm -hmm. shoot the. Um, I had access, I was given access because I used it very delicately. Yeah. I never, um, I just kind of would read a situation and know when to question, when to pull mm -hmm. back. And so, and it was only after um, Cardinal Law resigned and left that I was no longer allowed in. When Bishop Lennon took over, oh, the doors were closed to me. Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was going to ask a related question, which is what's always fascinated me about you and your relation with the survivors is how you establish credibility with the survivors, you know, coming in. And, and maybe, uh, maybe you don't want to pursue that no, more, but no. maybe it's no, between you and Kathy to understand how you as a documentary artist, you know, somehow established that relationship, which is so close, but very fraught in the beginning. I mean, having heard the whispers, <laughs> who is that? You know, who is the photographer for this? I, 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 um, 
I just tried to tell the truth. I yeah. just tried, and I didn't rush anything. I didn't. I understood why people mistrusted me. I didn't blame them at all. Yeah. Do you so, have a strategy in that, or did it just come naturally? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I mean, I, I well, it's just yeah. Is that your? That's you. You think it's about finally it. her, but there yeah. was also, for me at least, there was this consistency. Yeah. Um, you were there. Um, she right. was there as much as everyone else was there, and and just that consistency alone, and the consistency of how she was there, that didn't waver either. Um, it wasn't like one week she was there and saying, "Oh, those stupid people," or you know, there was no judgment. It was just her her presence was there consistent, taking photos of whatever her photo I, you know, whatever her, the artistic part of her wanted to capture. And um, I, that's, I think, one of the things that made it very easy for me to um, become very comfortable with Lisa, yeah. was, was consistency. I was really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's Maybe not. I picked up on that, too. <laughs> <laughs> I was really uncomfortable. I mean, I was scared. Yeah. I didn't understand all the yelling and screaming. Uh, I, I just, you know, it, I'm not a yeller and screamer. And I, uh, I was scared. I knew people didn't like me. I, I couldn't really wrap my mind around what they were saying. Well, you and didn't grow up in the church. I didn't grow up in the church, so I didn't have the deference, and I didn't have the uh, rage. The sense of betrayal. I didn't have the sense of betrayal. Well, eventually I did, because, you know, I mean, I had spent yeah. 10 years working for an institution that was, um, you know, covering up the most heinous of crimes, mm -hmm. and I'm sorry, but the excuse that we didn't know. Mm -hmm. It's just such bullshit. It's just not okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if you didn't know, you should have known that an adult raping a child is a problem. And even if you are so closed in your world that you are not gonna go to um, the police with it, well, take the damn rapist <laughs> away from the children. Like, it's not that complicated. Right. And also, I just want to add one of the, her honesty. That was, the, she always was honest about her past involvement with the church, that she was, she had worked in the church, that she know, you know. So I would say honesty and, mm -hmm. and consistency and gradually conversations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We began talking. Yeah. But Jenny was up first. Um, yes, um, so, so great to hear this conversation. Um, so one thing I just wanted to um, ask you, I've heard you tell the story of how you grew this project um, over the years. And one um, thing that you would say um, connected to how uncomfortable it was to be in the middle of all this. but. At the same time, your your empathy and your connection was always super clear hearing the story. But one question um, when you told your story before was someone once asked you, whose side are you on, Lisa? Mm -hmm. And um, hearing that question now um, yeah. in this yeah. room, um, I wonder if you wanted to yeah. just, I wanted to tease out that, that yeah. piece of the way you replied back then. Mm -hmm. you, you know, that was Rick Webb. Um, um, whose wife uh, was a victim of clergy abuse as a child. And, and the, you know, she's a therapist and involved with SNAP. And Rick was the, ang I would, he was one of the angriest protesters. He's the one who carried around a sign that said House of Rape. And he had a bullhorn. He was really aggressive. And he would confront people as they would come into the cathedral. And one day he turned to me without the bullhorn, we were on the side of the church. I remember he turned to me, because I just was there all the time, and he said, Lisa, whose side are you on? And I just looked at him, because I don't like to talk a lot when I photograph, actually, you know, kind of recede. 
And he said, are you going to help us get rid of cardinal law or what? And I just said, Rick, I'm just, the, I'm, I'm just photographing. I'm just trying to understand what's happening. Like, I can't do that. You know, that's not for, for me to do. Um, and so I think that was the thing that kept me sane through it. It was just the commitment to the photography. And knowing, you know, just having this belief that, you know, we we make things that last, and you know, hopefully you make a book or a recording or something that other people can see over the long, um, you know, length of history, and um, they can never say it didn't happen. And I have a new mantra now too. I, I, it's like. Even if it never gets read or never gets seen or never gets heard, it doesn't mean it's not worth doing. Mm -hmm. And you don't know that long after you cross over, it may get read and be just the thing someone needed to see. I have a question about the intersection of activism and art. Um, several of you have mentioned openness. And I know, Lisa, you talked about um, not having a goal when you go into a project. And I'm just curious for each of you, is that openness something that you start with, that's there throughout the whole process? Does it evolve mm -hmm. as, as a way to approach all of this? How does that change over time? Um, for me, it changes over time. I know Lisa might be different, but um, I think, I'm not sure if I go, I think I'll often go into a project thinking I'm doing one thing. Mm -hmm. Like for this project, for example, I, I thought I was making one kind of image and then the more that you look and you think about the work that you're making and the more that you read or you talk to people, then maybe the direction of the work um, changes. And I guess I would just say that because I think, I think photography is such a literal medium that it's hard to be too narrow with it or the work becomes overly didactic. Mm -hmm. And so I think the work has to be a little bit open to make room for the audience, to make room for communicating something so that people looking at the image can bring something of themselves to the, to the work. Um, for me, I, I agree with Billy, it changes um, from time. And one of, the, one of the proudest things that I think I am of, what we did, there were 20 survivors that came, 22 survivors came together, and by consensus, um, and that's not easy, in consen consensus, in this case, I created a new definition, means I may not like it, but I can live with it. Okay. <laughs> um, and because we were responding to what people kept asking us, what do you want? What do you want? What do survivors want? So we sat down and we wrote this document and we called it the call to reform. And, um, you know, tried to present it to O'Malley. And it was, had a lot of compassion in it. You know, it was like, I think one of the most, the best places of the compassion, it, it, it required a lot of openness. And, and the compassion was, for those priests who were abusing children or, or vulnerable adults, you need to not let them around them and take them to create a place. Okay, don't send them to prison, but create a place. Let them do them, say their mass, let them say, but never let them off this site. And I'm simplifying now, but never let them off this site without someone accompanying them that knows and understands the dynamics of sexual abuse and predators. Okay. You know, so we, I mean, we worked really hard on this, and I, I wrote a paper on it because we tried to present it, O'Malley on the papers, in the newspapers, always, I know, when we were survivors, any time, any place, they just said, three times we were denied. Mm -hmm. And we called a press conference and said, three times we were denied. And to this day, as far as, we sent it to them, but never a response to it, mm -hmm. you know, so. Um, and just recently, we were able to pass it on to somebody um, that really understands sexual wrote books of South Judy Herman, and we'll see what if maybe it'll, maybe you'll see the light of day through the, through her. And I was just so excited that she wanted it. Um, she's a great um, therapist, psychotherapist, and book writer. So well, and a total leader in the movement oh, against yeah. sexual assault and rape, and education about it, and supporting survivors and helping them understand how to move forward. Even her first book, Father Daughter Incest, I remember somebody had given me a stuffed animal early on, and it was a polar bear. And in her book, she had talked about Saint Dimphna, who was the patron saint of the mentally afflicted. And to this day, my kids 
know the name of my stuffed animal, which is <laughs> Dimpna. <laughs> I mean, I'll answer that just by saying that um, I wanted to be an activist as a younger person. I, you know, I, I had very strong opinions about everything. Um, and when I finally, you know, settled on photography, every time I would try to take photographs that were activism, you know, that had an agenda, it just, I just felt they, they didn't work as well. And, you, you know, I, I was trained as a photojournalist, and, and when I worked as a photojournalist, um, I hated the fact that the, well, all the work I did as an independent, you know, as a photographer, editorial work, commercial work, whatever, there was always, you were just there to illustrate mm -hmm. the, the preconceived idea, and I just couldn't handle it. And, um, so that's, you know, my own work has always been much more open without an agenda because I, I think then more of yourself come, can come through the work if you don't start with the answer. So that's what I had rejected in my paid work and it's what I reject in my personal work. I'm doing work now, so let's see more. Your, your collection is the only collection. What did you say the other night? I mean, oh, this yeah, is really, yeah. This yeah, is really yeah. significant, yeah. I yeah. think. When Billy asked me uh, the other day, and she said, you know, how are things different for you? I said, I just finally have realized that my work is the only collection of still photographs that looks deeply at the church, at the survivors, and at the protesters. And it... And that, you know, by having all the elements in there, it makes the work stronger and helps explain the work of the survivors mm -hmm. as this kind of stepping stone towards the Me Too movement and, you know, towards, you know, from this culture of denial and silence to a culture of transparency and accountability um, that we're trying to move towards in a lot of parts of society. And, and it just has been, this is kind of what I was saying about the show, um, that it has helped me realize that the thing that I thought was a limitation for many years, that my work with the church I had felt was a limitation, now I understand that it actually deepens the work for change. Um, yeah. I may have said that the other day, sorry. <laughs> 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 yes. Well, even at that, I'm filling up this kid because it's just so powerful to me as a survivor. Um, number one, to be part of that, but with what she's captured, and and it's there, and it's not going anywhere. Yeah, it's there. Yeah. yeah. There's this author named Kevin Quashing who writes about quiet activism, mm -hmm. and I would say that your images are a quiet activism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so there's a, there's a power to that. Yeah, quiet activism. Yeah. Uh, someone said that about the layout. Uh, the show that the decisions that you made about the pictures and how to lay them out uh, doesn't hit people over the head with mm -hmm. an agenda, mm -hmm. but it creates a space where you, you can slowly absorb um, what's happening. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's all to your credit because I, I, I couldn't do that with my own work. Mm -hmm. I can't see that. I wish somebody had a hand up like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was thinking about. Um, Two of the, the photographs in particular, I mean, they were, they all struck me, but I was thinking about um, the photograph of uh, Cardinal Law sort of surrounded by a couple of advisors, and then the photo of the, um, the lawyers uh, with this, yeah. this sort of like smug um, kind of look on their faces. And I, I was thinking about um, your, like, one idea I was thinking about was historical narratives, which we think about a lot today. How do we, how are people constructing things, you know, deep into the future? But then also your, um, and so like looking at it today, looking, you can, you have looked at those people and it's easy to be like, oh, that guy's bad mm. and that guy's, and those guys are bad. Mm. And then walk away from it. And I'm wondering about whether um, uh, as a sort of, I don't want to call you a neutral observer, but as a, um, you know, in the position that you were that you were observing from, did you see 
um, people coming to understand what they had done mm. or not done, mm. or did you? Mm. Um, I heard Cardinal Law say a few things in public because I didn't have a private relationship with him or I was talking privately. I witnessed him in public and listened to what he said. And at certain points I, I heard things. I remember once at, <clears throat> at the um, at Mission Church, um, he, there was an angry protest outside. I forget which documents had been revealed that day, but people were really angry. And, um, and he was angry because he was dealing with the depositions and the lawyers mm -hmm. and all that. But when he stood up in front of the church, he said to uh, the parishioners, he said, don't be angry about the people outside. They have a right to be angry at us, at me, at me. And he took you know, that teeny little bit of responsibility. <clears throat> but I never felt, I never felt that he understood things. He certainly didn't understand things the way I did or the way Kathy did or the other survivors who I work with um, because, because he had his religion, you know, and so the answer was always, you know, some religious thing. That, um, but the other thing I'll say to that is that I actually find power very interesting. I mean, I think the reason that I stayed working for the pilot for many years was I felt like I was like a um, just being welcomed into uh, the separate city state oh. in Boston that my peers didn't know anything about. Yeah, and part of it felt very much like an authentic Boston mm -hmm. that you know those of us who our transplants here, and, and especially if you're not Catholic, you know, you just have no access to. But also I found, you know, the opportunity to witness power in action fascinating. Wow, that's interesting. I mean, you know, I saw him interact with all kinds of people yeah. who just worshiped him mm -hmm. and watching how he managed that and other bishops as well. And you know, I worked for the Anti-Defamation League for a long time through there as well. Mm -hmm. And um, people in the Anti-Defamation League were close with mm -hmm. Cardinal Law and Bishop Murphy and other leaders in the church because one of Cardinal yeah. Law's uh, things was interdenominational relations. Yeah. And there were very strong relationships there between Jewish institutions and mm -hmm. um, Law's um, cabinet. So I don't know if that answers your question at all. Um, uh, not so much. I, I, you don't have to answer my question. No, no, I want to answer I'm just curious about, I, I think I'm glad that you mentioned power, because I, I often think about like institutional power and like people right, can sort of justify things they do by saying, well, you know, it's my job or like it's my position. I have mm -hmm. to do that kind of thing. Or I have to make that kind of thing. And so, yeah, I. Um, I guess maybe flipping it instead of like what you saw in them, did 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 um, your stance as an artist observing people going through this process, you know, did it affect the way you would, would photograph them, sort of levels of sympathy or not sympathy or human witnessing humanity being exerted or power being exerted or the intersections of those things? Um, you know, photography, my kind of photography where you really can't control anything. You know, I'm not intervening, it's all candid, so really my only impact is choosing where to go on a given day and then where to stand in the room, you know, in the space and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, um, there was the people who were closest to dealing with the, um, the facts of the abuse, the, the, the people I knew in the church who were responsible for going through all the files and finding the information dealing with it, mm -hmm. they were human beings. I mean, there was no defensiveness with them. They were not protecting the church anymore. They were mortified and, um, you know, 
I didn't feel any, I mean, they're priests, so they're different from me. You know, there's never, I'm never going to be able to, I'm never going to, you know, I can't bridge that gap. Um, but then there was Barbara Thorpe, who um, was the liaison to, you know, from the archdiocese to um, victims and survivors. And um, she was always the most supportive person of me. You know, whereas I felt like when I was outside the church, the, the the activists were angry at me for going inside the church, and when I was inside the church, I felt people were angry at me for talking to the protesters outside. And Barbara Thorpe was the one person who just constantly said, "Thank you for what you're doing, Lisa. Thank you for what you're doing. This is important. This is important." And um, she didn't come too late, though. She, yeah. That, and yes. Said you went through a lot of months without, it, without yeah. anybody like that. That's yeah. right. And and so did survivors go through a lot of months with absolute <clears throat> horror shows with the church, trying to tell the story, trying to, you know. So it was that those initial <laughs> six months. Of, I don't know when Barbara started. Maybe in August, I think, mm -hmm. of that year. Sounds mm -hmm. about right. Um, and she, yeah. I was just going to say that Barbara recently published an article that yeah, I thought yeah. was kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, very, you know, she, she said things that Kathy was saying 20 years ago. Yeah. You know, it's a crime. Let's stop calling it a crisis or a scandal. Let's stop using these fluffy terms. It's been 35 years since we've known. You know, the information has been there. And it's, it's, it's an insidious um, problem, not, not a crime. I'd be really interested in hearing from you speak a little bit about your, more about the work you did interviewing the survivors mm -hmm. through at the exhibition uh, yeah. audio and previously one of the amazing incarnations of this work was um, the film. And now you have, you know, this exhibition where you see the work differently. And I'd just like to hear a little about the process, like what how one working in one medium has informed the other. Um, well, relationships with, with yeah, the I mean, the three people I worked with were Kathy, um, uh, Olin Horn, who had a very different approach to his activism right. than Kathy did, does, um, and Bill Codswell, who um, was you know, really struggling through those years. And I remember one day um, he came to a protest. He wasn't there all the time. It was, it was taxing for him. And, and um, a, a radio reporter came up to him and asked him a really, you know, one of those questions that they ask, ex like looking for a sound bite. Mm -hmm. And he just started talking like Phil. <laughs> And he went into this long thing about his spirit and truth and, you know, just like beautiful. It was beautiful. And it took about eight seconds for her to realize, you know, she wasn't going to get a sound bite. And she just walked away. And I just laughed. And Bill just laughed. And, and like, I think that was one of the things that made me realize, oh, you know, <laughs> we got to do something here. I mean, the pictures weren't expressing the complexity, but, you know, these three people were just so interesting. Yeah. And um, the way it worked is um, I let them each decide how they wanted to be recorded. And so Kathy would take me places where she grew up in Green Tree, she tried to show me where the church was and all that stuff. So we were in and out of the car. Um, Phil would only speak you know, it would only be recorded while he drove mm -hmm. and took me around the tour of Concord where, you know, telling me his stories. Mm -hmm. But that was it. He didn't want to be recorded in any other situations. Mm -hmm. And Olin um, only wanted to be recorded on the phone. Uh -huh. huh. So I don't know, I came up with some device that plugged into my phone <laughs> that connected to some recording machine and... Um, we would talk for hours and 
I recently, you know, that was all, this was all shot on film and all the recordings were done on an analog system. And um, a couple of years ago, I had the audio engineer from Boston College, thank you, John, um, re record, uh, uh, digitize everything. And so I went back and was listening because I don't know how many hours, there was probably hundreds of hours of recording. And I just started laughing because there was, it, Kathy and I were talking the same way we talk now. It's like, we didn't start recording until we already, with everyone, we were already bonded. And then it just, it's all stayed the same. And Phil and Olin as well, I'm still close with. And um, so, you know, there just was never anything to, um, well, I, the other thing I would say is that some of what they told me was very difficult to hear. And uh, some of what Kathy told me was very difficult to hear, and I didn't understand it. And I either just listened or I asked her to explain it, and it took me a long time, you know, to really get it all. So, yeah. Um, Lisa, your work is documentary in black and white, Billy versus in color, beautiful, quiet, mysterious, light, quality of light. I wondered if you could both talk about the nuances of how you see your work connecting in terms of the proposal of the exhibition that you're working on together. Also, it faded somehow to a one. But okay, <laughs> so we have bumper time though, so it's, okay. I just want to let you know. Um, I guess think of Lisa's work as the outside work and mine as the inside work, mm -hmm. and maybe Lisa's is the, Lisa's work is showing what you can see instead of. From what, what was happening in the moment, and then maybe my work, maybe you could think about as um, what it, what the experience of what it may, perhaps it, it, it felt like at the end after the protests um, went home. Now that that might be um, I'm overstepping the, the line a little bit, but I think one is sort of the interior work and one is the um, the exterior work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and um, I was always so frustrated with still photography, that the pictures were just so concrete. And when people look at them and, you know, if people look at my work and think, oh, this is about something that happened and it's over mm -hmm. and it's fixed, you know, I can't handle that. <laughs> <laughs> and so both the audio um, makes it more real. And then the connection with Billy's work opens it up to whatever it is that you're grappling with and whatever it is that you need to make a change on the inside. Because I, I think we all share this idea that we can't really change the outside unless we also look at the inside, you know, whether you call the shadow or the dark side or the hidden stuff and the confession, you know, whatever it is. Um, yeah. Oh, we have all kinds of people stepped in, Howard. Uh, I guess this is a question for, for Kathy. Uh, the photograph that this gentleman mentioned of the attorney standing, uh, you know, on to the left you have the attorneys for the archdiocese, uh, and then further down you have attorney Garabedian. And there's a real physical contrast between those people in terms of, and I'm just wondering what it was like, you know, how important was Garabedian to this whole process? Very important, and to this day, he's even more important than ever. He's okay. continued to um, just be out there doing this work for survivors. So huh. he, he was amazing, but that, that photo was amazing because it sort of really, for me, it, what, it, it, what it showed was the power of the church. Right. And, Poor Mitch, you know, was just like almost a little guy trying to um, go around. I mean, one of the, one of the one of the things that I, I wanted to say about the, the lawyers was when all that stuff that when the um, Constance Sweeney made them reveal the documents, mm -hmm. one of the lawyers revealed, and this speaks to the gentleman who was asking about did we see change in behavior at all or any accountability. They, the church had held on to a letter from a priest who had sexually abused a survivor, a victim that they knew, that had come and told them he had been abused, and they told them he was making it up. Mm -hmm. 
and the church held on to the letter with the priest apologizing for abusing the victim and never revealed that to that victim until Johnson Sweeney ordered those records to be revealed. So even though Mitch looked little, <laughs> the, the consistency and the, and the determination of the voices of survivors and their supporters and the lawyers who were backing them. I mean, there was Carmen, and there was, was um, Rick McLeish was the lawyer who actually came up with that. And Mitch to this day. We were having a conference in June, and, and Mitch has really um, made a donation to provide uh, for most of the expenses of the conference. So he's, he's just uh, you know, a wonderful lawyer. But he's been, it's been like Davy and Goliath, to use a biblical term. <laughs> Does that answer that, Howard? Yeah, no, it looks great. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, um, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I took a um, uh, personal interest in something in the world, I don't know, six months ago, and I said that uh, it's been going into a crisis over, over stuff, and it's maybe, maybe uh, the lineup of Maybe Catholicism in our country, um, with, with Ukraine, with this, uh, with uh, the French um, uh, story line that that that's been uh, out there, um, it it vacillated for me comfortably from three hundred and thirty thousand down to what you were putting in the flow as two hundred and sixteen thousand. Because I, I, you know, I hate the numbers. Actually, I, I just don't like them. But when they get up to those that that serious um, uh, uh, um, threshold, it was it was um, you know it's what happened all yeah. of a sudden. And, and I, I I I understand it. I mean, we and down in New Bedford, we've had the Portuguese church. The oldest one in the country closed, you know, and, and why, you know, and so, so you, you you get you understand in, in general, you, you feel this stuff, um, and I, but it was, I was, I was I felt like I was fighting bees in, in my in my just general vicinity, and I didn't know I didn't know what uh, it was um, exactly because we are dealing with a lot of superficial. Uh, um, constructs. Um, so, so, so as, as it stands, I'm I'm uh, feeling um, that, I, that we could um, use this general feeling <laughs> as a as a position in, in, in what's going on. And, and, and there, there, there it is. You've done it. I just want to congratulate you. Oh. For it. It's just a, a beautiful, it's a beautiful um, message that you that you that you've offered everyone. And uh, I mean, to the moon. Really, Thank you. I'm, I'm just I'm very <laughs> Thank happy. <you. laughs> Started saying, well, I can't deal with, I can't deal with what you're bringing to me right now. But did you know there were 330,000? You know, did you go to, you know, sort of like sort of, that. That was it, and I kind of walked away from three different conversations saying that to people quietly. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I disrupted everything. I wrecked everything. Kathy <laughs> <laughs> um, is. Talking about this a little bit this morning about the idea of learning to speak up and when to speak up. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would just say personally that um, I'm an optimist, but I'm also a realist. And that means that I know people are going to hurt other people, right? I mean, here we are, right, with the, the, the world the way it is. Um, and for me, the, what matters is how we respond. 
as individuals and as a society to bad things that happen. And um, so being someone who a person who's being hurt would come to is, you know, a great thing for all of us to, you know, have as a goal. Like, it, am I someone a person would come to and talk? You know, how we respond to people who are being hurt is what matters. We can't re, like, we can't change people's ideas about the past. All we can do is, um, I mean, I think for survivors, the hardest thing was not being able to speak, not being listened, not being believed. And then the horror of not knowing that what happened to you happened to someone else by the yeah. same perpetrator. I mean, the cruelty of that, of keeping that from someone who was just left alone to suffer, um, is, you know, it's kind of unbearable to me. So I think that's what we all try to do in our lives, right, is to um, listen to people and like make space for other people to share their truth. And you know, it's too difficult to do about the past. It just becomes an argument. So we just have to be together in the present. And you know, we are making it better. I mean, you know, it's, things are better now than they were 20 years ago. So. As I heard on the radio this morning, risk being the person that makes others feel awkward mm. takes a lot of courage. And, and shaky feelings afterwards, and the need, for me at least, to have somebody to support, to go to for support and say, it's okay, you needed to say that. Yeah. Do you have any last thoughts for us, Billy? Just that it's been an honor to work with, oh. work with you. It's, uh, it's very happy. Yeah. Thank so, you all for coming. Well. Yeah. Somehow today, for the first time, I heard the connection between the idea of reckoning and reconciliation, mm -hmm. which I've never heard before. I don't even know exactly what it is, but yeah. <laughs> yes. um, and I'm just going to make a quick pitch for Billy's book, which is on sale here. Um, and you just come take a look at one. You know, be welcome to. Also, in the back, I have some postcards for you to take home. And if you want to sign up, uh, with your email, we'll keep you in touch of, with, you know, whatever we're doing. <laughs> <laughs>